Hello, Pamela. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? It's going really well. Um, of course, we have to say that again in a few minutes too, so <laughs> people won't will we'll have to hear us say hello to each other twice. Um, uh, yeah. So, so apologize to everybody who was like, "What?" I thought this was supposed to start at noon. Uh, we start around noon, but so we're not. Ex you know, it's it's very complicated. I <laughs> I've done probably a hundred of these hangouts now, and it is like, uh, you know, getting ready to launch or you know take off on a seven forty seven with all the switches and stuff that we have to do. So, it looks uh, you know looks smooth and polished, but uh, maybe it doesn't even look smooth and polished. But but yeah, there's a lot to do. So so we try to sort of get everything organized and we run through, it, and then I realized that I had the the episode number wrong, and anyway, it was. Disaster. So, um, so now we're, <laughs> Nicole Gallucci says we're on belly dancer time. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> no idea. <laughs> if, she, if she wants to explain her joke a little more fully, that would be nice. Um, so uh, the way this works is, you know, hopefully some or all of you are uh, are listeners to Astronomy Cast, and you listen to it every week in your podcast feed. Uh, we're up to now episode two hundred and seventy-five. So. About a year ago, we switched to doing these as Google Plus Hangouts, so Pamela and I can actually see each other, we can interact, we get to see Hamla, Pamela do all of her hand gestures as she's talking about rotating planets and stuff. Uh, and so we will record the show, and today's topic is Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. Um, and then when we're finished the show, We'll stick around for another, whatever, 20 minutes, half hour. Uh, we'll answer all the questions that, that you might have, both about Isaac Newton or just about space and astronomy in general, uh, especially uh, last night's episode of uh, The Simpsons, if anyone wants to wonder about a black hole. Can we actually generate a black hole and, and destroy uh, Springfield? So... Um, <clears throat> So here's how you do this. Uh, if you want to post a question, there's four places that you can you can ask a question. So the first place is if you're watching this on the event page on Google+, you should see the video up at the top there, and there's questions coming, and they're in reverse order, but you can post a question in there, and we'll see it. Uh, if you're watching this on like my Google+, Plus page, which uh, will be somewhere, um, uh, you'll be able to see that. Uh, if you're and so you can post a question there. If you're watching this on YouTube and you want to post a question on YouTube, uh, you can post a question there. And if you're watching this embedded anywhere else on the internet, uh, or you just want to, you know, leave it full screen, you've got a Twitter client or whatever, feel free to use the hashtag AstronomyCast either on Twitter or on Google Plus, and we'll be able to get the question there. So that is. Uh, that's how you can find it. Now, uh, if you're watching this after the fact and you want to, uh, and you, you're enjoying the show, but you had no idea what Astronomy Cast is, and you're like, whoa, 275 episodes, I'd like more, please. Uh, you can always go to the Astronomy Cast website, and there's our link. We can also search for us on iTunes, and uh, you can go back and download our entire back catalog all the way to episode number one, where we explain why Pluto is no longer a planet. So, um, what else should we do? Oh, the last thing is um, is if you want to watch this, uh, if you want to be reminded that we're going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast, you can go and circle the Astronomy Cast page on Google Plus. And then what I do is when I create a new event, I circle everybody, I, I invite everybody who is an Astronomy Cast fan, and that way, you know, you'll get a notification. It'll pop into your calendar, and you'll be able to, you'll be reminded to come and watch the show. So uh, you can you can do that if you haven't already. Whew. Okay, <laughs> Pamela, is there, is it, was there any more housekeeping before we actually get going to the actual episode? Not that I can think of. I think you covered just about everything on how to watch and participate. I made a list. <laughs> um, all right, let's. Uh, all right, let's roll. So, uh, are you set and ready to record? I'm hoping. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Uh, I'm good. Okay, tell me when you want to press record. I am pressing record, and it's actually recording. Testing, testing. Yeah, I'm recording as well. Um, okay, I got my intro. You ready to roll? Yes. All right, let's go. Uh, in that you're never ready, in that I will about to unleash <laughs> a puni punishing hail of questions that you're completely unprepared for. and Exactly. We'll, uh, right. Okay, perfect. All right, here we go. Astronomy count. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> Should we try that again? All right. Straight face. Here we go. 
Astronomy Cast, episode 275 for Monday, October 8th, 2012. Isaac Newton. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? And happy uh, Canadian Thanksgiving to you. I, I, you have a Canadian husband, and so I'm sure you are made aware every year that, that this is the proper and true Thanksgiving, and not the other one. So it's good. I hope you had turkey last night. Or I, I sadly was on a plane last night, oh, right. so, so I, I had a sad ravioli. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know if we had anything, I don't, we didn't think of anything to announce, so I don't think we will. Um, actually, you know what we should announce is just to remind people that uh, we record every episode of Astronomy Cast now as a live Google Plus Hangout, and if you want to join us and watch us record live and ask your questions, uh, we are, um, you can circle the Astronomy Cast page on Google Plus, and then you'll get a notification when we're going to record, but normally record uh, Mondays at noon Pacific time, 3 Eastern, uh, do the math for all the other time zones. Uh, cool. All right. Well, are you ready to go? I, I'm hoping. You always find something I'm not ready for. Just, just you wait. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, <laughs> let's go. So Isaac Newton has been called the greatest and most influential scientist who ever lived. And that sounds about right. He unlocked our modern understanding of gravity and the laws of motion, dabbled in optics, philosophy, even alchemy. And he's also known to have a bit of a difficult personality. So let's find out everything we can about Isaac Newton. All right. So, uh, so if you could like pick one discovery that Isaac Newton was most famous for? Gravity? I think it's it's probably a tie between gravity and calculus because more people have to learn calculus than remember gravity. That's true. Um, so then then who was this guy and, and where did he sort of come from? Well, so, so the odd thing is that while he's most remembered as a scientist, he was a, a, a Brit who was eccentric, who was difficult to work with, who is generally believed to have Asperger's, and who wrote far more about um, Christian hermetics and uh, occult and alchemy than he did about science. So it, it's just fascinating that a lot of what he did was based on trying to use science to, to understand religion and use logic to translate the Bible. Um, he was fluent in Hebrew, um, but it, it's his writing related to science that, that survives to the modern day. I always think of him like as like a Sheldon Cooper, I got to say. You know? I, I, I think that that's fairly accurate, but had Sheldon listened to his mother concerning religion? Although it's to say Newton uh, did, didn't believe in, in the Holy Trinity. He thought that uh, worshiping Jesus was idolatry. Um, so, so while he was a, a Christian hermetic, he was also a heretic. And so he was just like a totally confusing dude. Yeah, and he did some pretty weird experiments. I, I hope we'll get to the one where he jammed a knitting needle in his eye to, uh, to, to see how optics worked. But, uh, but let's go back then. So where, so where did he come from? Where did he grow up and, and get his initial education? Um, so, so he was born prematurely on Christmas Day in the old calendar, and his father died three months later. Um, he was born in Worthup by Collistworth in Lincolnshire, England, where they have long good, and names. That's a good British name for a town. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, so, so according to his mother, you could basically stick the poor guy in a mug upon his birth. He was quite small. And his father died a few months after he was born, and his mother remarried and then left poor young Newton to be raised by his grandmother and um, according to all accounts Newton never fully got on with his stepfather or particularly got on with his mother after that so he had a difficult childhood um, he did go to school went to college but then had to drop out of college when his mother's second husband passed away and she said he needed to come back and be a farmer um, except as one might imagine, uh, academics don't make the best farmers under many situations, especially not the physically science bent ones. Um, and, and eventually the university convinced his mother to let him go back to school. 
So he just had a very difficult beginning to his life, uh, but he was able to complete his, his education. He, he went on uh, to get a position at Cambridge that allowed him to both work for the university and study. And, uh, now what, sorry, what time frame are we looking at here? I'm just trying to give some, get some context here. I mean, he was sort of in the, what, the 1700s? Uh, he was actually, well, he was in the 17th century. He was born in 1642. He died at the beginning of the 1700s, um, so so his childhood was was all during the the 1600s. He actually um, was overlapping with the uh, bubonic plague, which. One interesting thing to think about is the university shut down due to the plague at various times, and it was while he was sent home to avoid dying of the plague, as one hopes to do, um, that he was able to accomplish a lot of his writing. Right. Okay. And so he went, ended up at Cambridge, which was like the perfect place for you know somebody interested in these kinds of topics. Yes. Yeah, so so he was able to 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 finish his education while he he was at Cambridge um, and and this was back in the days before you got a specific degree in physics you got a specific degree in uh, mathematics it was pretty much a university degree and while he was in university he studied Descartes and Copernicus and all the great thinkers um, and it was while he he was working on all of his studies that he started to figure out um, advanced mathematical theories in 1665 he developed the binomial theorem so so his his initial uh, work was let's think about all of the great philosophers let's think about all of the great scientists and let's work on building mathematical treaties and and so he started with the binomial theorem and has been torturing math students ever since yeah I think I've been tortured by that one um, <laughs> right okay so 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 pure math so so then how you know but I mean he's he's famous for so many different things so right so how did his education take him further into that well so so the the thing with with uh, being an academic back then was it wasn't like today where you said I want a grant to go do foo I want a grant to go do foo it was more a matter of you thought sat you thought you worked you exchanged letters and and so for him he he developed the binomial theory um, about the time that that he was done with that and he had graduated uh, the university temporarily closed due to the Great Plague, uh, bubonic plague. Uh, this was its its second massive sweep through England, and and when he went home, um, it was while he was home that he started working on developing calculus and working in optics and thinking about the law of gravitation. Um, so between 1665 and 1667, he was he was working from his house, something that that I know you and I both enjoy getting to do. <laughs> yeah. um, but in those pre-internet days, that meant you were kind of trapped um, and and left on your own with your thoughts. But Newton was such that that he he died a virgin, according to all accounts. He never had a relationship with a woman. While he had some good friends who were men that he exchanged letters with, for the most part, he was a very solitary individual. So these years were highly productive for him. And when he re returned to Cambridge as a fellow of Trinity University, um, it it was it, a chance for him to to continue working on um, although one of the things that he had to deal with was the fellows at that time were required to become ordained priests and and so Newton had the fun of, of trying to avoid becoming a, a a priest who as I said he was a heretic and it's it's kind of hard to commit yourself to becoming a priest when you recognize you don't believe uh, that that Jesus Christ is is part of the Trinity and and while you're good with God uh, you're not good with the modern views of the church so so he had an interesting time at that point and and eventually managed to avoid becoming a priest by becoming well the Lucasian chair um, which is the chair that's now held by Stephen Hawking so uh, he sort of started a grand tradition at that point now do you need to eject the dog there yeah I was hoping to keep her quiet <laughs> Sorry, Preston. 
The problem I run into is is my office door doesn't thoroughly close, and so the the dog can just kind of bring herself in, although normally she doesn't. Um. All right. Uh, okay. Sorry, Preston. <clears throat> so I I answered that I I ended with he became a Lucasian chair. Right, which is Stephen Hawking's position. Okay, yeah. so I wanted to talk a bit about the um, uh, sort of the, the specific sciences that he that he worked on. So why don't okay. we kind of go there next? Okay, all right. Okay. Um, all right, ready? Here we go. Yep. Okay, so I mean, he, he had sort of quite an interesting life, as you said. You know, very reminiscent of sort of personality-wise of Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, which I think is a, is a great model. Sheldon uh, had a girlfriend. Newton did not. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, uh, that's debatable. Uh, so you, so I think that. So what are sort of the? But during this time, very productive. You know, couple of decades. Yeah. M massive improvements in all kinds of sciences and math. So I think we should really break down these different topics of study that he went through, and sort of put them in you know some kind of order and really take a look at all the things that he. So so what was you know you said he worked on binomial theory. What were some of the other really big and important groundbreaking? areas of study that he worked on and you know well, what was the process the the advancement of of calculus infinitesimal calculus this is where you take the sum of all the littlest pieces and add them up to find the area under a curve basically um, he, he developed that in order to be able to advance his physics and and one of the the interesting problems uh, faced by people trying to uh, put all of the pieces together is is Newton didn't want to share or publish anything he didn't feel was absolutely perfect because he greatly feared being scorned or ridiculed so while he developed calculus most likely in the the late 1660s um, he didn't bother to get around to publishing it until the late 1680s and this opened the door for Leibniz to be um, in a position to co-discover calculus and put his theories forward and try and claim that he was the developer of it. Um, luckily uh, the, the book Principia, which is, is much of Isaac Newton's um, theories on physics, clearly required him to have developed calculus. And he had other earlier books, um, I, one, uh, a manuscript on the motion of bodies in orbit, um, that, that clearly also required some form of calculus to have been present as well in order for him to have come to the conclusions he came to. So it's now generally accepted that Newton developed it first, but what's interesting is we use Leibniz's notation for it because it's considered to just be the easier way to notate calculus. And this just comes back to this constant situation with the early scientists where, you know, in, in order to do the kind of work that they wanted to do, they would have to invent the various pieces of the puzzle to be able to do it. And so you have the situation where in order to be able to do better, better, math for gravity he had to invent possibly the most important math you know mathematic invention in the last thousand years you know as a tool in the same way right. that Galileo had to invent a new way of a thermometer or you know what I mean that that, that there was this I don't know, there was almost like an expectation that if you were going to push the boundaries, not only were you going to have to push the boundaries in your science, but you were going to have to come up with the instruments and the technology and the methods and, you know, I could imagine him going, well, I need a computer, so it's time to sit down and, you know, <laughs> invent you know, silicon conductors because that's what I got to do to be able to, I don't know, compute how I can turn lead into gold, you know? Yeah, it, it wasn't quite like that, but one of the, I think most reaching things that that Isaac Newton did in a certain way in a certain framework is um, he was such a perfectionist in what he did that when he finally did get around to sharing his different theories when he finally got around to publishing his results he did it in such a thorough manner and with such a concise language that the the style with which he wrote Principia is considered to be the best possible style that a scientist can use. So 
Well, yes, he defined the calculus that, that everything we do, unfortunately, relies on, or fortunately, depending on how you feel about uh, having to sit down and do mathematics. While he is, is one of the early people to have sorted out many different things with optics, while he sorted out why Kepler's equations work, and we'll describe all of these in a moment, the way that he described these things it's not just used in physical sciences, it's not just used in mathematics, it's used across all of academia as a way to discuss scientific concepts. So he defined the language with which we use as professional scientists to communicate to one another. Wow, that's, that's pretty deep. Uh, okay, so we've got calculus, uh, what else? Um, so, so binomial theory, calculus, those, those were really the, the big things for him when it, when it comes to mathematics. He did lots of other things, but, but those are, are the big things that people walk away with. Um, optics is probably next. Um, he, he was the first person to really put together the pieces that white light, the, the light that comes out of incandescent light bulbs, the, the uh, light that comes from the sun that when you uh, focus it onto a wall you get a nice white circle, um, although we typically talk about the sun as being yellow, but that's a complicated discussion. Yeah. Um, white light he realized is actually just the combination, the additive combination of a variety of different colors. And by playing with prisms and lenses, he realized that you can use a prism to, to diffuse all those different colors. And he realized that lenses in their own way use the same principles as that prism. And because of that, any telescope that's ever made that uses lenses is always going to be dividing all of that white light out into all of its individual colors. This is something called chromatic aberration. And in order to prove that he was right, he developed a new type of telescope that we call the Newtonian telescope that uses a reflecting mirror. And, and for him, the idea wasn't so much to build the better telescope, but to show that lenses refract light into all of its different colors, whereas mirrors simply reflect the beams. Um, for him, this was, he, he thought of, well, what we now call photons as, as corpuscles, so it was the corpuscular theory. Um, today, we recognize that light is both particles and waves, but he was one of the early people saying it's particles, and here's how you treat it mathematically as particles, and here's how mirrors don't care what color those particles are. So that, that was kind of a creepy, awesome modern thing. And so what's the sort of darning needle in his eyeball story? So, so I have to admit that I'm completely grossed out by eyeballs, so any reference I had of that in my head had been blocked out until you brought it back up at the beginning of the show. Oh, really? Um, okay, all right. So, well, so I, if, if I recall, <laughs> then um, he, he wanted to see how the, light, how the eyeball distorted light, how it acts as a lens, and so he... He, he he took a need, knitting needle and he kind of jammed it. Are you, is it going to squick you out? Yes. Okay, wait. <laughs> knitting needle. Google squeaked, it. <laughs> squeezed, squeezed his eyeball around a bit and uh, and and took a look at how it um, affected the light and how it changed his vision and uh, yuck. You know, yuck. You know, nearly blinded himself. So yeah, no, yeah. Go ahead, Google the story. Yeah, yeah. But it's the it's the kind of thing that would occur to him. He's just like, well, I got to figure this out, and I am the uh, I am the closest human around. Yuck. So let's get to uh, yeah, let's perform the experiment. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, not I've so big on eyeballs. I've learned something new about you. Yeah, yeah. I I can't even watch people eyeballs. put contacts in. I am totally no. I squeed out by eyeballs. No, I've never put a contact lens in. I can't even imagine doing it. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, okay, well let's, let's let's move on then, so we can move past optics. So he he so again, you know, figured out like prisms, rainbows, light breaking right. up, combining again. Okay, also and, and very so, important. So in 1675, he, he published his hypothesis on light, um, putting forward his ideas in written form, um, and uh, talked about uh, the idea of the ether being something that transmitted it. Luckily, it turns out light doesn't need any such thing. It's quite happy to go through vacuum. Um, and... Uh, 
it, what's interesting is he he worked with so many other scientists over the year. He's he worked with Hooke, with Henry Moore, um, and and he started thinking about light in terms of alchemy, um, and and. At one point, he actually re replaced the ether in his ideas with occult forces, and and so occasionally he wandered away from mathematical reality and tried to use science to to prove occult ideas, which is is kind of something that that most people don't learn. It's hilarious. I wonder how much. But but I guess the question is like back in that time, when you think about their line of thinking, was you know was the occult just the the occult was absolutely true. Alchemy was true, and so and so it was perfectly reasonable to use your logic and your reason and your experiments to try and understand these these you know. But that the that the I don't know that the occult or the alchemy all this, but, it was all just the same. You know what I mean? He, and that, he actually took it further than others. This is why he was so afraid of of being accused of being a heretic, and he never talk to people about his beliefs. He did have a lot of writing that went unpublished. Um, and and so he this wasn't mainstream. Um, John Maynard Keyes actually wrote that Newton was the first of the age of reason um, but the last of the magicians. And and so so here you have the, this man of science but he he wasn't actually a man of science. He, in his head, it was the occult, it was religion, it was alchemy, um, and he was simply trying to prove it with reason as the age of reason was getting started. Hmm. This wasn't mainstream. He was the guy on the radio in the middle of the night, except he had the math to back up what he said. But but I wonder if you, like putting it into the context context of the time like no, were the things he was still that he a was, crazy dude he was still a crazy okay so it's not like the things that he was talking about and the and the topics that he wanted to go into were well accepted and regarded and a lot of people shared his beliefs no he was he put people off and they were wondering why that's all he wanted to talk about and they had all they had it's, all it's more already a, moved on right it's it's more a matter of he did all of this work all of this writing he he even traveled around trying to find meaning in the architecture of buildings in the old world going down to Greece and Rome and uh, studying the tomb of Solomon uh, and and this, for the most part, was all kept secret because he he knew it wasn't normal. It it's sort of like he worked so hard to to avoid becoming a priest because he knew his ideas weren't normal. So he's the crazy person who's self aware that he's crazy, and and didn't publish most of his work. It was kept in letters and documents that came out after his death. Um, for the most part, he he refrained. And what he published to completed completed ideas. So this is where his Principia of Physics, his optics, on well optics, were complete ideas that he published as a whole. But he could never reach completion on his occult ideas. So those didn't get released on the public. Luckily, it might have had devastating effects on his career, and he knew that. So we're at 24 minutes or so, and we haven't even gotten to gravity, and there's lots of other stuff that you did. So do you want to make this two shows? Sure. Yeah? Because, I mean, you know, we'll probably go another couple of minutes, and then we can we can wrap it up and then pick up all of the gravity and stuff and death. and. Well, his death was kind of boring. He just lived to be an old guy. Yeah. Um, we can probably... I mean, we we lost a minute or two to the dog leaving the yes, room. Yes, no, I know, but we're still, you know, we're, we'll be in this sort of 26, 28 minute range within a couple of minutes. So, I mean, we've got all of gravity. Yeah, we but go gravity's... To 35. A, sure, a, yeah. Gravity can be done briefly. Okay, well, well then we'll... Sure, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Well, let's keep rolling then. Okay. Okay, so, so we've got all of his, his work into the into the optics and stuff. But I guess we're missing sort of the or the next logical step here is the is the thing we talked about right at the beginning, which is his incredible work on gravity. So, so what was the concept of gravity before Newton 
had a think about it. I, it. It wasn't so much that it existed. I We had Kepler's laws, but the idea of forces didn't exist. That that came about from Newton's work. And and so starting in, in 1679, he started thinking about celestial mechanics. He started trying to understand what caused Kepler's laws. And while he was working on all of this, um, the, the ideas started to build, he started putting together his um, theories of motion, equations of motion, kinematic equations as we refer to them today depending on what book you set, pick up. And, and it all started to come together as a whole and this, this is where his book Principia came, came together which was published in 1687. So he finally pulled all the pieces together in this one, it's still considered to be perhaps the best written science book of all time. Um, he basically sat down and put all the pieces together into a whole that we now call Physics 1 in university, where, where you start with, well, here are the equations of motion. Okay, where do the equations of motion come from? Well, you have forces acting. Well, what's the force that's acting on the moon, on objects that are falling? Well, that's gravity. And it's this beautiful, crystal clear notion once you add force and once you're willing to admit that, well, maybe there's this invisible force pulling objects together and, and well, since things fall it was easy to follow this through to its end. And it's just this beautiful, clean-cut theory that people angst over far too much. Now, what about this whole concept of the apple falling? See, that, that one's argued about whether or not it's apocryphal or just an analogy, he told. Um, so most people think it probably never happened and it was just a convenient way to explain things. But the, but the idea is, you know, an apple. He saw an apple falling and then... So, so the story goes that, that he saw an apple falling, he looked up, saw the moon, realized that the moon is falling as well, but the way it's falling is it's constantly missing the Earth and just curving around our planet. And this is something that we've talked about in our own astronomy cast on gravity. Right, right. It's this concept that if you had a cannon and you shot it sideways fast enough, um, it would eventually just go into orbit around the Earth, that it would just keep falling further and further from where it was shot until it was, if you shot it fast enough, it would just be, it would go into orbit. And it still is falling, but it's also falling at the same amount of sp uh, speed, I guess, that it's, you know, moving around the Earth as well. And so it just keeps going into orbit. And, but that's a, I mean, that's a stunning recognize you know recognition to kind of kind of see the apple fall and kind of go huh the apple and the moon that's the same thing and that's you know whether you say it's apocryphal that's the the way he described it in the I think it's the Principia anyway um, but that's the way he described it right was to say that they're all just falling that it's all forces and it's all the same thing and and he did this when he was in his 40s so so he accomplished mathematics, geometry, binomial theorem, he did binomial theorem while still in university, gravity all before his 40s and he still went on to have ev even more of a diverse career. He went on to head up the, the Royal Mint where he was responsible for investigating a large number of um, uh, forged coins and doing all of the detailed investigations and, and he was someone who just couldn't leave a, a mystery uninvestigated, whether that mystery be what is it that causes a prism to, to break up light to what is it that, uh, well, what, what, how was it that all of these coins, coins were forged? He, he estimated at one point that 20% of the coins that were swapped out in the great recoinage of 1696 were actually counterfeit coins, and counterfeiting was high treason. So, um, yeah, he had a lot of investigating to do that led to people being drawn and quartered. Um, so his, his um, heritage also includes causing people to be killed. Right. So we've got gravity, we've got uh, his work on the Royal Mint, we've got his chair, what, at Cambridge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cambridge. Um, and this is, isn't this the chair that Stephen Hawking holds yes. now? Yeah. Yeah, you were mentioning that. Beginning. Yeah, right. Um, so it's, I mean, a long and, you know, long history after after his. So, so okay, so he does gra work in gravity, he's working at the Mint, anything left? He well, he lived on? into his 80s, and what, what's interesting is uh, 
he lived this long and fruitful life where he was once once he reached adulthood he he lived that academics life where where you stay in the fellows halls in the university and you exchange letters with others and he moved in amazing circles knowing Locke and Voltaire um, and and interestingly enough he had a niece who was stunningly beautiful and uh, is, is one of the ones who ended up with all of his papers later and and there's letters exchanged where he showed that he wasn't always a cold-hearted Aspergery scientist but he actually wrote it his love to her in in friendly uncle love nothing nothing skeezy or anything like that yeah um, but it, it's because of this relationship with his niece that so many of his papers were able to be um, well carried into the future and so he said he lived in his 80s where did he die um, he died in England. He he died while still working at the university. And uh, I'm trying to think. Isn't wasn't his grave part of the um, uh, part of that awful Dan Brown book? Yeah, that's true. But I don't I don't know if any of that was uh, uh, at all reading. betrayed. And yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, what a what a great story, and what a, and what a great man, and what a weird man. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. You have to keep so, in context the weirdness, which the weirdness, does show. Yeah. Occasionally, you do have to listen to the crazy crackpot people who are making their own shit up because if they use math, they could be right. But if they don't use math, it just ignore them. Right. I, I always I sort of think about it like our forum. You know, like yeah. he's the kind of person who we would give him thirty days on our forum, and then we would not let him propose his ideas anymore so so what what Fraser's be, talking about right yeah so so what Fraser's talking about is the bad astronomy universe today forums that are hosted on cosmoquest.org and there's a um, part of the forum where people can present their their own alternative theories of reality and uh, they have 30 days to be interrogated by the community and if they can match all of the questions well then they're allowed to continue talking about their theory and hopefully moving it forward and changing science um, so far no one succeeded yeah, it hasn't happened yet no. no and then that's it 30 days and then the conversation is closed and they don't get to talk about it again so um, cool well thank you very much Pamela and I think we we're hoping to do this as a two-parter next week we're going to talk about the XMM Newton telescope which yes. was uh, based on his name so uh, the way we, that's the way we roll so we'll see you uh, we'll see you all next week Bye -bye. Thanks, Pamela. But don't go anywhere. We're just pausing our recordings. Stop. Yes. Save. Yes. Export. Done. We're safe. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, so once again, if anybody wants to ask us any questions for, as it relates to Newton or space and astronomy in general or uh, whatever you want, we're glad to take them. Uh, you can comment on the event page if you're watching it there. You can comment on uh, the Google Plus if you're watching it in, you know, shared or reshared somewhere. Uh, you can post a question in uh, on YouTube or if you want to use Twitter, you can use the hashtag AstronomyCast. We'll stick around and, and answer some questions and uh, if we don't get any questions, we will uh, we'll, we'll shut this hangout down. And and I only have twenty minutes today because because yeah. we're running behind and yeah. I have a three fifteen. Yeah, I don't have a lot of time either, so I've got a three fifteen. Yeah, okay, yeah, I've got a three thirty by your time in the future. Um, uh, okay, so we got a question here for Pamela regarding light speed limit. Um, it is a law unless you're a quantum particle tunneling. Are you reading the question? No, I'm. I oh, okay. simply right. that is the answer to everything about light speed. Um, okay, so the I guess the question is: How is it possible that the universe during inflation was expanding faster than the speed of light when nothing is able to move faster than the speed of light? A expansion uh, is is different from moving. Um, so the the way to think about it is you're you're inserting stuff in. And, and so these two particles aren't moving. It's the amount of space between them is getting greater. So they haven't moved. They're still attached to the, the coordinate system of the universe at the same place, but those two places now have more stuff between them. 
Yeah, and this is a question, you know, you got to sort of say with respect to what, right? That if you've got these two yeah. particles and they're already a, whatever, a trillion light years apart, and then you expand them out, they're going to be moving faster than the speed of light from each other, but there they're is They're going no to be light. appearing to appearing. move. They aren't yeah. actually moving. Right, because space itself is the thing that's doing the expansion. So yeah. it's totally they're legit. They're going to be carried apart from one another at greater than the speed of light. And there's this implication, right, where you know, in the far, far future, as the expansion of the universe is continuing to accelerate, where where galaxies are going to start to disappear off this horizon because they're now moving away from us faster than the speed of light, and so the light from them will never reach us. Yeah. But, but they're not actually moving in space faster than the speed of light. It's just that space itself is carrying them away faster than the speed of light. And and the the way from to think perspective, but right. not necessarily from a galaxy that's closer to them. So 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 the way to think of this is is the the Pamela maximum speed is is probably about five miles per hour, maybe six miles per hour if 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 I practice for a while. Um, and and I regularly go far faster than my speed limit because I'm getting carried around by a car, an airplane, the planet the Earth rotation is carrying of the planet, around. and the rotation around the galaxy, yeah. and the expansion of the universe. Yeah, so it's so all no, with respect to what? Right. Um, so Ilya Sarah asks: So do particles behind the black hole event horizon move faster than light? No. Well, it, we have no way. It, the physics doesn't exist in a way we can communicate inside the event horizon. Uh, base, basic answer is once, once you go within the event horizon, physics shouldn't change except for um, we have no way about talking about the densities of materials as they get down into the singularity. Right. But again, it's not that the laws of physics break down. It right. is that... Is that our understanding of the laws of physics are incomplete. The math that we use to describe it breaks. Something and that's a in there is happening. Error. Yeah, something in there is happening. We just can't understand it. Don't understand it yet. So yeah, we need another Newton who's hopefully a little bit more socially well adjusted, right. uh, or less. <laughs> you know, less into the occult. More time for science. <laughs> um, Sheldon Cooper would be perfect. Uh, right. So I mean, the situation you get is. You know, is a black hole? We don't. There's a bunch of things we don't know about a black hole, right? Yeah. Is is a black hole a singularity, or sorry, is it a sort of discrete size? Like you, you know, if you went into a supermassive black hole and could somehow withstand the forces, could you touch the black hole surface, or is it that the black hole is continuing to collapse infinitely at an infinite speed, and you know, and it's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and you just can't see it because you know. There's nothing stopping its collapse at this point. That, that we know. Don't the problem know. is we don't know how to explain the particles that are inside of the black hole. We know that um, neutrons collapse, but we don't know what things collapse into um, when, when the pressures are too high for a neutron to stay a neutron. Do you think we could do a show on calculus? Do you love me? <laughs> well... <laughs> we we could. I just don't know how you do an audio show on calculus. I know, I know but we did an audio show on uh, on astrophotography. So uh, it's a puzzler. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. Yeah, I, I think that may be one of those topics that you don't do without a whiteboard. Well, right, but I guess, the, but to get at the core of it, I mean, I, I mean, as you, you hinted at it, right, which is that calculus is about you have a curve and you measure the distance under the curve and it's a way to add up all of the distances under the curve in a way that that is useful and so I think there are some analogies there anyway stick it in your brain and rattle it around because I guess the thing is like calculus is like is like this wall this impenetrable wall for a lot of people and right but the, that... the problem is teaching calculus without teaching physics is somewhat of a pointless endeavor that many many math teachers tried to do um, but but to truly understand calculus in many ways, you need to, to understand the physics, and this is where it starts to become a, a cart and horse issue of mm -hmm. you, you need to understand, well, why does all of this stuff matter? How does it all pull together? And, and you need to be drawing three-dimensional objects, and it's, yeah. I'm just, you know, I, I think you're up for the task. 
and I, I think, think the, the fans, the fans <laughs> watching, will will agree with me. And it might be a train wreck of a show, but you know, I can ask you the right questions and try to uh, parrot your intelligent things in a sort of way that maybe can add more detail. So I don't know. Anyway, I think it'd be an interesting challenge. It'd be like dancing about architecture, right? Um, okay, yeah. So someone's calling you. Someone says, uh, "I heard a rumor that Doctor Gate doesn't like math." So. <laughs> <laughs> you so you math. don't have to like something to understand it. And and this is this is the agreement I make with all of my students when I teach physics. There are certain aspects of the class that we can all great get together in hating, but we need to be able to do it completely. Yeah. I also really don't like doing uh, uh, crossword puzzles. Um, so so we all have different things that we don't enjoy. Um, I, I have the freedom to choose not to do crossword puzzles. I don't have the freedom to not understand calculus. And I, I've taken calculus all the way through Calc 3. I've utilized it in many, many ways. I, I even learned it in both Russian and English because apparently, uh, yeah, I'm just twisted that way. So you can hate something and know how to understand it. It's when you, you can't do it that you're not allowed to hate it. So, uh, Tim, so you know what? I'm going to give you an easier question then. So, Tim Amato wants to know, was there anything that existed before the singularity? And so, I guess what Tim is saying here is, you know, this, the thought about the Big Bang is that the universe started, a, you know, within a sort of singularity, and then we had the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe and inflation and all that kind of stuff. So, so was there anything that was before the singularity? Uh, invalid question. Invalid question. So I think one of the most um, interesting recent conversations on the subject is the one by Lawrence Krauss. There's a, there's a video presentation that he did called A Universe from Nothing. And then there was a book that he just released as well. And it's really interesting and covers this question and doesn't necessarily say what came before the Big Bang, but at least sort of provides a really compelling argument, not an argument, but it's sort of an, an interesting observation that, that essentially if you add up all of the matter and all of the light and all of the particles and then you subtract the gravity and you've got the antimatter, that the actual sum of the universe is zero. You know, when you add and take away all the things, you know, you like you do like double entry bookkeeping, right? And you add up all the stuff from the universe and all the stuff you take it away, you end up with zero, which is really fascinating because if it wasn't zero, it would make the universe a lot more complicated. But the fact that it is zero is is quite interesting. So um, highly recommend you you watch that that video and you know, read his book as well. What's well, gross is a neat guy. Did he get a shush from you? No. No, that was that was uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson was wasn't he on that panel? He was on. Yeah, the it panel. was uh, Lawrence Krauss, myself, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and Bill Nye. And I think he deserved Phil, a shush from you. He did. Yeah, he was just deGrasse Tyson got got caught in the uh, you know at the moment when you're being talked over. <laughs> I had a valid point, and he had a snarky joke, and I wanted to say something scientific, and I did. It was the shush heard round the world. <laughs> Again, if you're feeling like doing some, you know, maybe some people can post some of these things that I'm talking about into the YouTube because I can't both talk and dig up YouTube sources. But uh, Act YouTube Actually, so my Wikipedia page is so massively out of date, it's not even funny. So if someone out there can add some of this stuff to my Wikipedia page, it would be yeah. glorious. And your fantastic uh, presentation at the last TAM. And uh, you and I was completely surprised that you were interviewed on the Skeptics Guide to the Universe this week. I don't know if you remember they interviewed you at TAM, yeah, and it was a fantastic interview with you about sort of making the world a better place and dealing with trolls and uh, and it was wonderful. So if anyone has missed that, go back and and get their hands on the Skeptics Guide to the Universe, which on its own is one of the best podcasts out there. And, I would and say my it's maybe interview the is, second best science podcast. My interview is well into it because I know I started listening to the episode and never got as far as my interview because I, I ran out of time. So be prepared to sit for a while or use the fast forward button, which I don't use. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Mark Brown wants to know, how would Newton's telescope compare to today's consumer telescopes? They're designed using Newton's design. But how, like, how big a telescope did he have? Oh, 
Um, you know, that that's I, I want to say that he basically had a less well-coded version of like your standard four-inch telescope and then over time got bigger and bigger and bigger. Hold so on. what what he was using was completely equivalent to the stuff that, that we use as, as university professors and backyard astronomers. Used for teaching as, as a university professor. Um... We're just better with the materials nowadays. So uh, Brian Jimenez asks, uh, how can we understand singularities if nature does not create points? So I don't know if that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. Well, I guess, does nature create points? Or is everything a three-dimensional object in nature? And so can we have a singularity? But I think the idea of a singularity is not necessarily that it is a point, it is just right. a, a location where something is It's approaching where the universe point. divided by zero, or right. divided by infinity, pick one. Right, but you can imagine something getting smaller, and you just say it is, it is getting smaller at an accelerating rate as fast as it can, and it's getting as small as it can. It will never be zero size, but it's just going to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and due to the wave-particle duality of, of everything, um, this becomes something very hard to discuss because are you talking about it when it, the wave function has collapsed or are you talking about it as that wave-particle duality? Um, so it, it starts, starts to become a, um, we need more words in order to answer your question. Um, Ilya Sarah asks, uh, what was that particle that was measured moving faster than light? Can't remember, has this affected some views of physics? Um, so so it, it's not so much that things move faster than the speed of light as quantum tunneling allows a variety of different particles to jump from point A to point B. And what the, the way this, this happens is their wave function goes from being primarily located over here to oozing over for lack of a better way to explain it without mathematics, oozing over a, a potential barrier and collapsing on the other side of the potential barrier. Right. I mean, a way to describe that is the fact that, you know, you take an electron and it is most probably right here, but it's also potentially anywhere in the entire universe, that its probability function spreads across the entire universe. But but also, I think the, the idea was the neutrinos, I think what the person is mentioning is the neutrinos that were detected moving faster than the speed of light. Oh, that was a faulty cable. And that was that was a mistake. That was a it was a bad GPS unit. Yeah, so. it, they just didn't plug their cable in all the way, and it was introducing a timing error. Yeah, so it was a mistake, and fortunately, the laws of physics uh, were not <laughs> destroyed that day. Yeah, there's a good argument going on in the in the comments about whether we could do a calculus episode or not. So, <laughs> um, uh. Yeah, okay, so so about the importance and how we use it and that that would and, be possible. And and for those who, who are saying that, that it's my hatred is causing me to not be able to do it or anything like that, I completed uh, Calculus 1 as a junior in high school. So it's, it's really simply a matter of I take no pleasure in math for the sake of math. I like doing physics and astronomy where physical reality is tangled in with the numbers and letters. That's cool. Um, I'm trying to think. I do, I do calculus in grade 12. We don't, I don't know what a junior is. Would that be a senior? Um, I was 17 years old. Yeah, so was I. Yeah. I had one more year of high school left. Oh, so. it was in my last year of high school. Yeah, and so I took Calc 1, Calc 2, started university in Calc 3. Um, well, I think we're kind of running out of questions. So if anyone's got a last question, someone suggested a... Uh, uh, an episode on Newtonian telescopes, which would be kind of interesting, I think. Could We've we done... stretch that into 30 minutes? I don't know. Maybe reflecting telescopes. Yeah, and then refracting. And so, but I mean, so there's some famous telescopes. And, and, and we need to check ways. what we've already done. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. All right, well, I think we're, I think we're good. So, so everyone's okay. takeaway, your homework, everybody, is to find... Uh, Pamela's presentation at uh, the amazing meeting and be inspired by by her um, and also to uh, check out this uh, a universe from nothing and it's you know it's about an hour long presentation by Lawrence Krauss 
and it uh, makes you think. And hopefully, if you've been all been been watching or listening to Astronomy Cast, you should be pretty well equipped to be able to do that. Uh, what's next in our train of science uh, stuff this week? We're going to have the weekly space hangout, which I believe is you and Emily doing an update on Curiosity oh, on Wednesday. We, we? Oh, that's, <laughs> so that's, the, that's the weekly science hour. Right, so weekly science hour, then there's the space hangout Thursday morning, which yep. will be a roundup of the latest news, so I'm assuming there will be discussion on SpaceX, failure yes. or not. Um, and, and not, it got to space. Right, but there, so what's interesting is all the people who are, comp who are saying, it's a failure, one of the engines failed, but the sucker worked automatically and compensated. So it, it's kind of awesome to watch mm. how stupid people are on the internet. Mm, I see. Okay. Um, uh, and, and then, of course, uh, the Antares launch out of Wallops, which, which we're all waiting eagerly for, and uh, all that's new in science. Yep. Um, Sunday night, weather permitting, will be the virtual star party. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to miss a second one in a row due to travel, but hopefully mm. this time I won't be trapped in Chicago due to bird strike. Last week was uh, last night was really great. Actually, we we got a chance to see this new comet that's been that people have been taking oh, pictures cool. of. Not Comet Ison, but this other one, and I forget the number, the name. It's pretty complicated, but it was good. It was a it was a really good night. I think we're 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 like butter now. It's just going so fast with us, you know, pulling up objects, and you know, we probably went through twenty five objects last night. It was uh, it was really good. It's really smooth. Everyone on the west coast, unfortunately, so we didn't get anybody from the east oh. coast. Oh, and yeah. and if you're interested in being an observer for us, uh, drop us a note. Uh, yep. Also, talk to uh, Scott Lewis. He's yeah. he's our our herder cat herder in chief. Yep. And um, hopefully, we'll see you over on the bout forums hosted by CosmoQuest. Perfect. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thanks to everybody for joining us this week, and um, thanks for sticking with us and watching this episode live. Save up your killer questions for next week when we talk about the XMM Newton Telescope, and, uh, and we'll see you all around. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Bye-bye.